professor at Colorado State University in the USA, joining us online at this time for the invited speech. So now that we've all been refreshed with a little bit of tea and some snacks, I know we're going to enjoy what's about to come. Uh, and I want to touch on uh, a few achievements very quickly introducing Professor Anura to us all. He is the Professor in Electrical and Computer Engineering Department with joint appointments in the Computer Science Department and the Systems Engineering and Biomedical Engineering Departments. He is also the Associate Director, Information Science and Technology Center at the Colorado State University. Professor Anura obtained his Bachelor's in Engineering from the University of Morotua uh, in Sri Lanka here before proceeding uh, to the USA for further studies. He founded the Computer Networking Research Laboratory at the Colorado State University and is a member of NSF Engineering Research Center for Collaborative Adaptive Sensing of the Atmosphere. At uh, Colorado State University, he has supervised over 20 PhDs and more than 50 uh, master's programs and master's thesis. Uh, and taught courses ranging from freshman graduate courses to specialized uh, graduate courses in, in electrical and computing, uh, computer engineering. He's a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Communications Society uh, and has been so from the year 2014 right up to 2017 and has published uh, 300 or more than 300 research papers and also a book. Ladies and gentlemen, I won't take any more of his time. Professor Anura Jayasumana, thank you for joining us uh, online and I'd like to see whether we can connect him at this time. All right. Audio. Professor Andro, we can see you, but uh, your audio is not, uh, uh, we, can't, we can't hear you yet. If you could unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's fine. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen here. I think you can see my screen now, right? Good morning, yes. everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be able to present at your conference. Uh, I apologize for not being able to be there personally. Uh, so uh, the title of my talk is uh, Machine Learning, uh, Machine Learning and Synthetic Data, uh, the Potential and Pitfalls. So. Uh, Machine learning uh, has proliferated in the last few years, and the explosion of machine learning uh, can be mainly attributed to the availability of ma massive collections of data. Of course, two things, I mean, several other things uh, support that, uh, development of you know, proper algorithms, uh, fast processing, but without uh, massive volumes of data, uh, machine learning would not have uh, exploded uh, so quickly. So, uh, in fact, uh, the volume of real data that's available uh, keeps increasing. Uh, so this is a, a prediction that I uh, recently saw, uh, came from uh, some business groups. Uh, so data universe growth, we expect the data universe, these are, this is actually the real data that's available to grow more than 10 times from 2020 to 2030 reaching uh, 660 zettabytes. So that's equivalent to like uh, 610 iPhone equivalent per person, right? Uh, assuming that each iPhone has 128 gigabytes. Now, so this means that there's going to be a lot of real data uh, and it's going to increase because, you know, more and more people are going to use internet. Uh, it's has still not penetrated uh, more than 60 or 70 percent of the population. And then uh, there are going to be these Internet of Things devices, and the number of devices is uh, supposed to almost double 
uh, in the next uh, three to four years. So the question is, uh, if there's so much data, and uh, then why do we talk about synthetic data? So uh, this is another prediction uh, that came out uh, very recently. Uh, so this Gartner prediction, again, it's a business group. By 2024, 60% of the data used for the development of AI and analytics projects will be synthetically generated. In other words, even though we have all this uh, real data, actually we are relying more and more on synthetic data. Right? So what is synthetic data? This is like artificially generated uh, data. Uh, sometimes we call them artificial data, uh, not real data. And occasionally we use the term fake data. Uh, fake carries a negative connotation, uh, but synthetic data, uh, it's, a, it's a better term. So, uh, there's a growth of uh, real data. So why do we why do we use this synthetic data? So this is another uh, continuation. This is another prediction. So by 2030, uh, synthetic data will completely overshadow real data in AI models. Right. So your machine learning models will be relying more and more on uh, synthetic synthetic data. So in this presentation, I'm trying to address uh, this. So we will talk about what is synthetic data uh, for the purpose of machine learning. Uh, why use synthetic data, right? And uh, to illustrate that, I will first talk about why my research group was compelled to generate and use uh, synthetic data. And we'll talk about uh, when to use synthetic data. And if you have time, we'll talk about uh, how to generate synthetic data and briefly talk about uh, pitfalls of using synthetic data. So I'm sure many of you have gone to this website. Uh, this is not a, this person does not exist.com. Every time you go there, it shows you a photo, right? Or you can refresh it, it'll... The thing is, these people do not exist. These are synthetically generated faces. In this case, of course, that, that learning model, the purpose is to generate these faces. But suppose we have these faces. Why use real faces to study faces? Or if you need to train a machine learning model, why do we want to use real faces where we violate privacy uh, and other things? Uh, sometimes we can't get enough samples. For example, we want people of a certain age, uh, 90 to 100 years and we can't get enough data in that age group, right? So in that case, we would generate synthetic data and use that. Uh, so other examples, there is uh, synthetic music, synthetic paintings, synthetic photos. Uh, you can specify something in text and ask for synthetic data. For example, there are packages that you can say, you can say paint a mountain lion roaming in candy. There are no mountain lions in Sri Lanka uh, and they wouldn't be roaming in candy. Right, but you can you can basically generate a photo of a mountain lion uh, roaming in candy, and that is actually synthetic data. Uh, ChatGPT actually is uh, a synthetic data generator. Right, we give a text input, it produces synthetic text, which actually sounds very realistic. So, so this this presentation about not not about generating synthetic data, but why do we use this data to train machine learning models? So when I say data, you know, I, I will use, I'll be using pictures as examples because it, everybody can see a picture and understand what's happening. But uh, this data could be numeric data, textual data, streaming data, whatever. Uh, and synthetic, synthesizing data is not the same as augmenting data or obfuscation of existing data or anonymization or randomization. Right. This is purely generating synthetic data. So for our purpose, synthetic data is artificially generated data, uh, typically to mimic some real data, not necessarily. And this data is obtained uh, from a generative process that learns the characteristics of, uh, of real data. Uh, when you generate synthetic data, sometimes you worry about the fidelity of the data, right? Ideally, they should be statistically identical. We have to capture the correlations and higher moments of data. Uh, they have to contain the same insights and correlations as the real data. But sometimes, actually, we are not interested in this. 
sometimes we are interested in uh, covering specific parameters like you know i'm interested in photos of people who are 95 to 105 years old and i'm interested i i need a sample of 10000 such faces uh, so you want to cover specific parameters sometimes the data that you have is not balanced certain ethnic groups may be uh, not represented well so in that case we want to balance the data so that uh, uh, the data set uh, is, is uh, more comprehensive right so there are uh, many other reasons and and we will come to this but i will start by talking about uh, you know why i was forced to basically start using synthetic data this was back in like 2018 2019 uh, so i was involved in this this uh, project uh, to uh, 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 identify violent extremist radicalization trajectories using the behavioral data right uh, violent extremist uh, we were looking for uh, ways to uh, predict who would be a homegrown violent extremist these are people who advocate and engage or in violent activities uh, in support of a terrorist organization uh, but these people act independently uh, and therefore it's very hard to catch so the only way to kind of uh, identify these people is to uh, track their social network behavior and try to predict it right so i partnered with a with a, a computational uh, uh, anthropologist who had this collection of data called western jihadism database so she had collected all the documented cases uh, uh, in in the western world but the database itself was only like you know consisted only like 500 people at the time but we wanted to uh, they they also had this indicator indicators about you know what uh, how we can detect these people right again i'm not going to go through this because the purpose is not to talk about this project but so so once you have this template uh, you know we, we we mine the social data uh, social network data and we create this knowledge graph about people and where they go and what type of tweets they do and things like that and once you have this knowledge base we basically form a query to identify uh, potential uh, uh, extremists uh, but the problem is this this database itself is dynamic it changes over time and uh, therefore uh, uh, to learn to use machine learning techniques uh, we need we need a lot of data and and we did not have that data right? so i will skip some uh, so we ended up building this system uh, to identify these extremists but we ran out of data so at that point we decided okay we need to generate synthetic data that mimic the real data set even though we had only 400 people or 500 people in our actual data set we need thousands of uh, profiles so uh, you know this data was complex not like pictures uh, these are like complex graph objects because these are knowledge networks we ended up generating those and again in the interest of time i will skip the, the characteristics but but we got a good data set and we were able to train our machine learning models and uh, uh, were fairly successful so this was before actually people started talking about synthetic data and at the time even though we, we used it we did not think about the fact that there's a potential for this synthetic data to explode right uh, so i will quickly uh, explain how to generate some uh, uh, synthetic data item so uh, some of you may be familiar with what we call auto encoders and auto encoder is a uh, machine learning model where you apply an input let's say here could be a picture you send it through a neural network that starts with a large number of uh, nodes and keeps decreasing to a small number of nodes here and then we expand it gradually and create a decoder so so we train this machine learning model so so in that in other words there are n pixels here maybe it reduces to something like m a smaller number and then from this m we try to recover the original thing so this is called an auto encoder right uh, so you apply a picture it comes out at the other end except this hidden layer we try to force it to like a gaussian distribution multivariate gaussian distribution so when we do that whenever you apply a picture uh it it is represented by this like you know compressed representation and 
once you apply that pattern here, you get an actual picture. So at that point, once you have finished training this, you can just forget about this part and start uh, generating Gaussian variables here and this will generate faces, right? So this is what we call variational autoencoder. This is uh, the technology that we used at the time. And there are many other actually uh, better, better technologies to do that. So uh, after doing that, uh, you know, when we talked to my colleagues, uh, actually we came up with other applications where it was very difficult to get data, either expensive uh, or uh, not possible in some cases. Uh, so there were two projects that where we used the same technique. Uh, one was to detect phishing websites. Uh, and, and in case of phishing websites, uh, collecting phishing websites, that's very difficult. It's a, it's a, it involves a lot of manual labor. And even if we collect the data set, it's very difficult to share them because people are worried about liability, right? If we didn't misidentify a uh, site as a, a phishing website and it is not, uh, there will be liability consequences. So, so in this case, we use the same, same method and actually use this to uh, generate, uh, to train machine learning models to detect phishing websites. So I want you to focus on this blue and red arrows. This is the machine learning network trained with the real data. This is with the synthetic data, red one, right? So these are for different data sets. And you can see on, in every case, actually when you add a little bit of synthesis, synthesized data, the performance of these machine learning models increase. Right. So in this case, we, by augmenting the machine learning model, uh, the training data set with a little bit of synthetic data, we can actually get a significant improvement in, in performance. Uh, then uh, in the process, uh, I also uh, started collaborating with some people at uh, Sydney University uh, and University of New South Wales. Uh, and they were interested in uh, looking at uh, video streams uh, for example, when you are watching a YouTube video or some, some other video, the video is encrypted, but you want to identify what video this person is watching, even though the traffic is encrypted, right? So it's very difficult to get a data set like that because you can gather the traces, but you don't, you don't have the data. Uh, you don't have the ground truth. So in this case, we apply the same technique. Uh, and uh, actually, I, again, I, I will skip the details. We use the synthetic data and uh, in this case you can see the, the the blue curve correspond to the actual data and the yellow curve corresponds to the uh, generated data synthetic data and and they look very similar so this is like the faces that i showed these video traces instead of going and measuring these video traces on a network which is very difficult to do and just generate the synthetic data and and, and deal with that and it, it it shows improved performance all right so in the meantime, you know, other people were encountering similar problems. Uh, and uh, there have been many cases where people started using synthetic data. So this is uh, an example from medicine, right? So uh, this article basically uh, says the proliferation of synthetic data in artificial intelligence for medicine and healthcare raises concerns about vulnerabilities of uh, software and challenges of current policy. So in this case, for example, you know, you're interested in certain, you know, detecting cancers or whatever. And sometimes certain types of cancers, you don't have enough data. So how do you, how do you train machine learning models for those things? So again, these guys, uh, you know, unknown to us and they didn't know what we were doing. They were using synthetic data to train uh, and improve their models. So in this case, you can see this is the AUC parameter for those of you who are familiar with machine learning models, how to measure the uh, performance. So in this case, the green curve corresponds to uh, the results when you mix the real data with synthetic data. And if you use only the real data, this is the performance you get, right? So you can see the performance increases from like 80% to 90% in, 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 in this case. And on top, you can see an example of a real image here and the synthesized image. Uh, so this is another uh, paper that, that appeared recently. So in this case, uh, they are trying to detect intrusions. But if you look at the intrusions, uh, the data that they, people can gather, it is not balanced. There are different types of intrusions. And in this case, you can get a lot of data of these intrusion types, but only very little data is available about these intrusion types, actually. So these are the more important data. So if you want to, again, use a machine learning model, 
uh, you need to balance it, right? So if you generate synthetic data and balance it out, you get better separation. So hopefully I have convinced you, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, the, the importance of it. And this is another example, let me take a minute. So in this case, these scientists were interested in the patterns that are generated when you crumple uh, uh, mylar sheet. So in this case, again, it's very difficult to do this manually and get photographs and, and, and do that. Uh, expensive uh, waste of uh, resources. So instead of that, what they did was they decided, okay, you know, maybe this, when you, when you generate fold a paper, uh, maybe we can use these patterns to learn something about it. But well, if you want to fold a paper, instead of doing that, let's generate those uh, synthetically, right? So in this case, this is the problem that you want to solve. Uh, the synthetic data that gen generated were as simple as this. This you can write a simple program to generate the data. And again, uh, they are having performance improved. All right, so uh, when to use synthetic data, as we saw in these cases, sometimes adding synthetic data improves the performance. And then uh, in other cases, especially like social science related things. So this is actually for the fishing data set. These are like four different data sets. You can see the first one was from 2018, 2012. And in this one, they measured only seven different things. Here they measured 30 things. Here they measured nine things. Here they measured 48 things. So you can't combine these data sets because these are like different things, right? But suppose I want to, I have a machine learning model that is capable of, that has been trained with this one and I want to uh, somehow evaluate this Oh, I want to combine these data sets into a single data set that is consistent. So in that case, what I can do is try to go and, you know, even though this has only nine of the features out of 48, I can go and synthetically generate the other 39 features here and get, in, get them into the same baseline, right? So that's another problem that, that, that we have been working on. Uh, and there are other cases where synthetic data may be the only thing that is available and only thing that is applicable. Right. So, for example, if you are uh, trying to solve some geometrical problems, you can generate geometric shapes of various you know, shapes and sizes, and you can do a pretty exhaustive job of generating those that data. So, in those cases, actually, you don't need any real data. Uh, so, I have just a couple of minutes left. Let me just give you a flavor of how to generate uh, this data. Uh, those of you who are working on machine learning uh, are very likely uh, familiar with generative adversarial networks. So in this case, for example, uh, I'm interested in generating phases, let's say. So I have a set of uh, data corresponding to phases. So what I do is I, I train a discriminator, right? It's a machine learning model. So I present to it real data and other pictures. And of course, I know which one are, are the real data and which is other types of pictures and I can train this discriminator, right? So discriminator basically decides it's the phase. If not, if it makes a wrong decision, you send the feedback and, and, and you do that. Now, so, so this way I can train this discriminator to identify whether it's a phase or not. Right? But now instead of feeding things randomly here, let me replace it with, with this unit, right? So in this case, I, I have a generator. This is supposed to be another machine learning unit and I'm about to start to train it. In this case, I'm just going to apply some noise to this as the input, and it's going to generate something, some garbage picture, which is not a face. So the discriminator basically looks at it and says, oh, it is not real. So I can give that feedback, and it will say with this probability it is not real. I can set that and uh, keep training this. And after some time, after enough training, this will actually start generating good data that the discriminator fails to detect, right? At the same time, the discriminator knows, okay, this one generated a, a phase, but I could not recognize that it was a synthesized phase, and therefore this also keeps adjusting. So in this case, basically both the discriminator and the generator keeps on improving their performance and the system becomes very good, right? This is how you uh, generate uh, the, the phases that I, uh, just uh, showed you at the, at the very beginning, right? So in this case, we may train two models, the generator and the discriminator. Uh, uh, they are trained in an adversarial manner. The goal of the discriminator is to correctly judge whether the data is 
data that it is seeing is real or synthetic. And the goal of the, the generator is to fool the discriminator, right? So, so they keep on improving and ultimately you get great results. So this is another way, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages of each model. So this is uh, another method to generate uh, synthetic data. This is called diffusion model, right? So in this case, suppose I start with a picture of a dog and I add some noise, so I get this one, right? So in this case, I have a picture, I add noise, and this is a, like a little bit fuzzy picture. So in this case, sorry, I, I, I will try to wrap up in, uh, in a couple of minutes here. So in this case, I have this noisy picture, and here I generate, I, I train this stage so that from this noisy picture, I can generate the original one. And then I have another stage where I start with this noise picture and I add a little bit more noise, and from that I can recover this. And if you keep on doing this, every time you, you go in this direction, you keep adding noise. So ultimately, it looks like a random noise pattern, right? But if you look at this stage, it can reverse this to the previous stage, this can reverse it to the previous stage, this can reverse it to the previous stage, and I can generate the original. So ultimately, once you train this entire system, if you apply a picture, it is represented by a pattern that looks like noise. On the other hand, if I start from on, on, on this side and I apply noise here, I get a picture like this. If I apply a different noise pattern, I get a different picture of a different dog, right? So this is what we call a diffu diffusion models. Uh, there's a lot of interest. This is, this is actually a much more recent uh, development, uh, 2021, published in 2021. And then uh, this is the latest actually called CycleGAN. Uh, again, uh, I will talk about this and maybe wrap it up very quickly. So in this case, uh, I have some data type, let's say faces, and I want I want to convert it to a different data type, like a, a you know Van Gogh painting of that that picture. So in order to do that, I have this discriminator that has that knows how to identify Van Gogh paintings from somebody else's. Uh, or some other things. So in this case, I have trained this discriminator. So in this case, I apply this data. This this one tries to convert X to Y. And if it doesn't look like a Van Gogh painting, this one will reject it and give the feedback. So this way, as you keep on training this, this generator becomes better and better. And ultimately, it's able to generate faces like Van Gogh faces, uh, faces drawn by Van Gogh, right? Now, let's and another thing, so in this case, I'm gonna go in the reverse process, exact same thing, except in this case, I'm start gonna start with this, and my goal is to generate this one here. Right. Now suppose this is working like we intend, that means after some time, this is actually generating pictures of type Y. So why bother feeding this data to here? Because I am getting type Y, or the Van Gogh paintings, I can just feed it here, right? So I can get rid of this data and instead I can feed it back here. And in fact, so here what do I get? Here I get pictures of type X, what I started with. So if I get if I'm getting this this original looking pictures, instead of feeding this data, I can actually feed this here, right? So this is what we call a cycle gap. So in this case, you, you feed data, you have something that converts data type X to data type Y. Now in this case, actually, this is a very powerful technique. So data type X could be, for example, going from a picture in summer to a picture in winter, uh, or picture to a painting, or it could even be a line of text to a picture corresponding to that line, right? So this is a very, very powerful technique, very, very recent technique. So I will show you some, some examples. So in this case, uh, this is an input. You know, these are the inputs that we use. And in this case, the network was supposed to generate Van Gogh paintings of those pictures, right? And then this is this Japanese Ikkyo E paintings. So same input, use, use that cycle again. It converts these photos to Ikkyo E type paintings. So this is what we call cycle GAN. And so those three techniques actually uh, can be used to generate uh, very, very good looking data. So something uh, bothers 
about this thing, right? So it looks like we start with a few phases and suddenly we can generate all these phases. So it looks like we are getting something from nothing, right? In fact, uh, there's this, this uh, thing called data processing inequality that says that you cannot increase the information content of something by doing any local processing, which is what it is. But in practice, it can be because, uh, you know, when you look at the information that we are interested in, things like faces, pictures, they follow certain characteristics, right? So as a result, it is not that we are, we are, we are at a fundamental sense, we are creating new information, it's that we are able to recognize those and, and so forth. So in the interest of time, I will uh, skip this. And to conclude, so in this case, we have this training, we start with this training data set, have the machine learning create artificial faces. Well, at that point, as I said, we can forget about this real data. We can use this to generate faces and uh, we, can, we can use it to analyze it. So in this case, instead of uh, the system that we originally used where we use real data to get some outcomes, now we have this machine learning system that generates the synthetic data, which are used to train another machine learning system to generate outcomes, right? Well, why do I even label this? I can just call this a machine learning system. So there's a machine learning system that will just generate outcomes, right? So is this a house of cards? Or is this a intelligent self-learning system? Uh, that's a question uh, that's, that remains to be answered. All right, so with that, uh, I think I have run over. I'll, I'll conclude and if there's time, I will take some questions. If not, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Anurajaya Sumana, for that very informative uh, session.